Really exciting day today. We're expecting delivery of a high magnetic field STM AFM that also goes down to temperatures about a factor of 10 and temperatures we've we've been able to achieve here previously. Um, it's been a long time coming. It's about two years, various delays due to um, oh how would we put it political developments and then COVID have really um, pushed this this project back quite a lot. So we've been waiting a very very long time. So I'm delighted that this day has finally arrived. So in this nicely refurbished new lab, we're going to have the new STM AFM system in this space. As you can see, it's empty right now. Um, up here is a camera that's going to capture the various stages of construction of this system. It's an ultra high vacuum system. It's a very, it's a low temperature system as well. So there's lots of stainless steel bits to assemble like a massive big Lego puzzle and um, that's what's going to occupy us for the next few days. Chap's just um, tying the, uh, the lorry closer into the wall. We're obviously going to unload from the side doors of the vehicle here and then we're going to use the forklift to transport the crates just up the hill there and then we struggle with pallet trucks to get it into the building. Let's hold, hold on to them if, if you've got the space to yeah, store yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. There's no point chucking in no, case yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So we're just in the early stages of bringing stuff in. These particular boxes are the controller that really is at the heart of it um, in terms of controlling the FTM. So, oh, it's started raining. Of course it has. How many of these systems have you installed, or Unisoco systems in general? In, in, in Europe, um, kind of. Okay, well, this is the first in the UK, that's mm. true. So all the crates are off the lorry, um, they're being undrilled, all the bolts are being taken out at the moment. I will get a drill in my hand and start helping out, I promise. We're just trying to sort a drill bit at the moment. So you can take one out, and okay. the other one should be left in until we okay, can see. Okay, so just one, one of each of these, okay, yeah. Yeah. perfect, okay. But any on the top you can take out. You know where you are when you've got a power drill in your hand. Just about. Well, like we planned it. Like we planned it. <laughs>
So it's day two of the installation and a huge amount has changed already. So all this wooden platform that was there, we're gonna have to rebuild that platform because at the moment it's slightly dangerous. This magnet has been dropped in. That magnet is about the same height as I am. Will be filled with liquid helium, about 90 liters of liquid helium in there. The um, UHV, the ultra high vacuum chambers have been added on top. Everything's been craned in. It's been, um, really really fun to watch this all emerge and to see it here now after sort of waiting for two years for this to happen is great is is just just wonderful the other great thing about it is the um guy who's really we're standing back and watching him do all his stuff because like a magician, like a master magician in terms of assembling this a guy called Thomas Berghaus. Thomas did his PhD right at the start, at the birth, at the origin of STM. And the group he was in was one of the groups that was quickest to follow on from the IBM invention of the, the scanning tunneling microscope and pick up and get that technology and start, build their own STM. The hard stuff in the beginning normally goes pretty quick. And then there will be days where uh, the tiny things are going to be happening. So like assembling the STM to the cryostat and the wiring and everything. and uh, then you do one wire per hour or something and nobody will see what you're doing. Really great to talk with Thomas because he was responsible for designing the STM1, the Omicron STM1 that I use for my PhD. We will assemble a lot of components like the titanium sublimator, like the lead optics, the sputter iron gun. Um, then we will assemble the transfer manipulators and uh, uh, when we then have all flanges closed with some function and so then we will pump it down a leak check and uh, next step will be then go for UHV with the bake out and everything and um, yeah before do some tests with the STMs and uh, eventually then after the bake out uh, cool the thing down and uh, yeah then the great hour comes. <laughs> So it's chamber, in, which is going the other side of this chamber, um, which is going to have to be lifted in over the top. Oh, it's it's high enough. To, it's not quite high enough to clear it. Yeah. So you got the same stand? Yep. You get the you get the other end. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Sean. Touchdown. <laughs> okay, thank you. So yeah, we've just craned in this chamber, which um, ultimately is going to have this thing on top of it going all the way down um, directly above the magnet um, and we're going to see all that come together over the course of the next few I'd like to say days but it's going to be weeks really so probably a month before we're going to see atoms so we are going just down to see the, the, um, the microscope now we're at day 13 Thomas has now left uh, to go back to Germany, Thomas and uh, a Japanese engineer, so the, the company that supplies the instrument is a company called Unisoko, uh, will be back on 15th of November. 
when we'll start. The, the system will be at a, a good vacuum at that stage. Okay, so you can feel it's really hot in here. Oh, wow. Um, and the reason it's really hot in here is because, well, things have, first of all, things have changed a lot, haven't they, since the last time you were here. Um, tables in place, magnets down there, this long transfer tube's in place. The whole thing is covered with tin foil because we're heating it up, and the reason we're heating it up is because ultimately, I'll take that off, ultimately um, we want to get to what's called an ultra-high vacuum in here. I've talked about this in other 60 Symbols videos at length, but what we're doing is we're heating up the system, and the tin foil's there just to keep everything nice and toasty. Um, to the key contaminant, if we don't do this, is water. The internal surface is all covered with a very thin film of water, and if we don't heat and pump, that water just stays there for months, if not years, and just leaks off the walls gradually and pollutes our vacuum. What we're doing now is we're boiling off the water, basically, accelerating the process, pumping it all away, so when everything cools down, after about a week, um, we'll get a much better vacuum. And then our pressure will be, oh, about a million, million times um, lower than atmospheric pressure, comparable to the pressure you get on the moon and on a good day, maybe even comparable to the pressures you get in some regions of deep space. So it's a pretty low pressure and we need those vacuums because we want to work with atomically um, clean samples. Um, if we want contaminants there, or if we want molecules on the surface that aren't part of this, you know, the original material, uh, that's because we want to introduce them. We don't want, you know, oxygen just and other contaminants from the air, CO, etc., and indeed water, landing on our sample and polluting it. So this is why we, we work this hard to get the, the vacuum. Where does the water go? The water gets pumped away by the pumps, so basically by turbo pumps. Uh, so by, um, there are pumps down here, which are basically coming along here, it's coming along these tubes, and then out the exhaust of this, this pump down here. So it just gets all pumped away. That's a very happy whale. Did they provide the foil? They, pro they even provided the foil. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. So, we're at day 45. Been up for day, for 45 days in a row at this stage, not really. It reached to its base temperature, which is about 300 millikelvin, which is about 10 times colder than out in the deepest, darkest depths of the universe, because the cosmic microwave background radiation is around 2.7 K. We have Yutaka visiting us from the company Unisoko, who's the CEO of, the, of Unisoko, who um, has played an absolute stormer, has been incredibly good, and a, another magician like Thomas in terms of getting the system up and running, training us on how to use it. To get down to those type of temperatures, we first of all are liquid nitrogen, then liquid helium, lots and lots of liquid helium that goes into that massive magnet. And the STM is down here, right at the bottom, all the way down here, or close to the bottom, the STM. This is a very, I think you saw this before when it was out, this insert that goes down there. To get down to 300 millikelvin, um, we use something called helium-3, a bottle of which, let me see, there we go. This is now pretty much empty, not entirely empty, but pretty much empty, because it's in there. At the moment, actually, it's going in the system. Um, that's about 30,000 pounds. So as Thomas said, you pay for um, helium-3, which is an isotope of helium, by the atom. It's extremely expensive. Um, but barring any disaster, which we can never rule out, we basically, um, the, the helium-3 can be effectively recycled. It's absorbed and then turns into the gas phase and is reabsorbed and condensed and then goes back into the gas phase, etc. So, but it's an expensive business and liquid helium, helium-4 is also not um, particularly um, inexpensive either and is actually a dwindling resource. So we are, I am very conscious of um, uh, all these various issues, let's put it that way. We are at, I believe, day 65, um, and we've been left on our own. The training wheels are off. You take our work extremely hard for four weeks or so, um, really doing all the commissioning and all the site acceptance in terms of what are the noise levels, does the magnet work when we go up to the highest fields? 
does everything cool and yes everything cools and down to uh, 320 millikelvin which as I might have mentioned before is 10 times colder than the cosmic microwave background radiation in the universe so the leftover remnants of the Big Bang radiation um, uh, so that's 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 a pretty cold place down in that magnet um, can be a pretty cold place in the universe not only does it get down to that temperature it gets down to that temperature and stays there for 63 hours what we say is our hold time is 63 hours that's that's very helpful for us it allows us to do prolonged experiments what we'd really like to do is to take the tip which is coated with gold atoms because we've deliberately crashed into the surface and then go dot and drop down an atom and dot and drop down another atom and dot and if we could do that, that would be a little short of magical. It would be really neat. However, what happens is that, yes, on occasion, and let me change the contrast here, we can indeed put down single atoms, these little features. But also, the problem is, sometimes when we do exactly the same process, larger clusters appear. So we, we, we have some degree of control, but not a great degree of control over just how many gold atoms we put down. But the good thing is that there's a reasonably high probability of putting down single gold atoms. And then what we want to do is then try and shunt those across the surface. So these lines in the background, well, imagine taking a crystal. In this case, it's gold, um, but it could be pretty much any crystal. And you slice that open to expose a surface. Now, the atoms that are at that surface are much less happy than they were when they were in the bulk because when they were in the bulk they interacted with their neighbours, they have a certain valence, they want that valence, they have a certain number of bonds they want to form but when you hack through the, 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 um, the crystal to expose that surface not always hacking through, sometimes it's a little bit more nuanced and careful than that but when you expose that surface, those atoms at the surface are uh, in a different state than the atoms in the bulk they're much more reactive, um, their energy is higher so what they will do um, is move around as much as possible usually given the constraints of how much thermal energy there is um, but they will uh, move around to try and minimize their energy to try to somehow drop back down into a situation that gets them closer to where they were in the bulk in terms of the overall energy and that's a process called surface reconstruction and it's absolutely fascinating because so many different surfaces form a range of different reconstructions here's here's an example of one really pretty one which is very famous that's just one example. There are literally thousands, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of different patterns out there that, are, that, that the atoms can find. And this is one of them. This is another famous one. This is called the herringbone reconstruction of gold. What you have here is these larger or these brighter regions. There's effectively a rumpling in the surface so that some atoms move up, some atoms move down. It's a very, very small rumpling. And again, they're doing that to try to relieve the strain, to try to bring their energy back down. And this reconstruction is very famous um, in terms of, uh, it's a very stringent test of the, the stability of a microscope and the res resolving power of the microscope in terms of can you resolve that herringbone? Can you um, see that without a great deal of noise? So the tip's moving back and forth and it's measuring, uh, we're telling it to keep the current between the tip and the sample constant and to keep that current constant what it has to do is move back and forth and follow the, the topography of the surface. Because it's a feedback loop and it's comparing the current value, it's comparing the value of the current it's measuring against the value of the current you want which we call the set point current that feedback loop has a certain response time. So if you drive past the point at which the feedback loop can respond, it, it can, at worst case, crash. So, yeah. This is the tunnel current that it's measuring, and this is the motion of the Z. How do we get such fine control over the position of the tip? Because we need to, move, to, to be able to measure, not down to the atomic limit, but actually to have precision better than the diameter of, the atom, of an atom. So we use piezoelectric elements. Those sound like rather esoteric technology, but they're not. You know those barbecue lighter things that you go click, click, and it gives you a spark at the end and you light your barbecue? What those are is, in the handle of those, is a piezoelectric crystal. And in that case, what happens, the property of the piezoelectric crystals is when you distort them, when you strain them, you build a big voltage up across them. It can actually be kilovolts, many kilovolts. Um, that's voltage is large enough to break down air, so you get the little spark. Um, turn that idea on its head 
and perhaps use piezos that are a little bit higher quality than those you get in barbecue lighters. And if you apply a voltage to the piezo electric crystal, it will distort. And you can, if you've got good high voltage amplifiers, no, low noise high voltage amplifiers, and good crystals, then you can control the position of the tip down to the picometer level. That's a hundredth of the diameter of an atom. You can see here, these air legs are in place to try to decouple or to decouple the instrument from the, the, the surrounding building. Because we're trying to work down at a level, as I've just said, of fractions of an atomic diameter, the floor on which you're standing, Sean, and which we're, well, I'm sort of sitting, um, is oscillating up and down, vibrating up and down at the level of microns, so about a million times bigger in terms of the, the, the amplitude of those oscillations than the type of precision we want to get to. So we need to decouple the system from the, the external building, and one key way of doing that is with these pneumatic legs, which lift the entire system up so it's supported by those legs. So these are where the, this is where the samples are introduced. This is called a load lock. We'd um, open this up, we'd unscrew this, we'd put our sample in on the end of this arm, then we'd pump this down, then we'd open that valve, then we'd move our sample into this chamber, and then we'd bring this one in to couple with that, pick it up, take this arm back, shut this off, so now it's back, it's not, it's um, isolated from this load lock, and we can then wait for the pressure to recover and then we can take our sample and bring it all the way in here to this monstrous beast of a transfer arm all the way up there and then to transfer samples into the microscope they're at the end of this arm and then we've got to go all the way down to the bottom of the magnet well close to the bottom, not quite the bottom of the magnet but close to the bottom of the magnet we're looking at individual atoms those atoms are fairly weakly bound because you can see even here the atom it's like a, uh, it's got discontinuities in it, it's got wobbliness in it because the tip is interacting um, with the atom and sort of dragging it and shifting its position a little bit. Interesting question is what colour is an atom? So important thing to realise with scanning probe microscope is a microscope like no other. We have that tip and our image is based on the current that's flowing between the tip and the sample and it's a quantum mechanical tunnelling current um, this is quantum mechanics in action you're seeing here, but the microscope itself has no optics, no lenses, no mirrors. It's, it's not imaging in the sense that a traditional microscope images. And our image is based on the amount of current we measure at different parts in the image. That's, that's basically what it is. So we can define whatever color scheme we like. So at the moment our atoms are sort of red yellow. Uh, if you want them sort of a bit blue, there they go. If you'd perhaps prefer to have them a bit sort of coppery, like that, or maybe um, even a sort of slightly different goldy color. Does that look gold to you? It looks more green to me. Let's see what winter's like. Oh, winter's like that. And Philippe's developed, put together his own palette, which is called the good one, which looks um, red and yellow again. You see these sharp changes? See this chart where it looks like the, the atom's been sliced? That's because it's interacting with the tip. Um, these other shadowy features are probably almost certainly, you see each one's got a tiny little ghost image. You get used to seeing these things. Sometimes it's difficult to spot them, but this tiny little ghost, very faint ghost, is probably because we've got a, a slight double on our tip. So, of course, as soon as you left, you started to work incredibly well, almost as soon as you went out the door. So, let me turn the screen view around, the camera view around, so you can see what's going on. So, I've spent a few happy hours depositing atoms from the tip. These, all these features that are roughly the same size are individual, almost certainly gold atoms that come off the tip, but we've crashed the tip quite heavily into the gold sample, so the tip is covered with gold atoms. We've got a reasonably high probability when we touch the tip into the sample of depositing a single gold atom. Actually, I believe this one, which is slightly bigger than the rest, the eagle-eyed among you might be able to spot, I believe this might be a dime or it might be two gold atoms. But we also have a probability for putting down rather more than one gold atom, and that's what these little clusters are, these brighter features. So it is, now where's the bloody camera down there, isn't it? So it is now 20 past three in the morning and it's been going pretty well. I'm a bit knackered, but my, this is fun. I'm building a structure atom by atom. Let me flip the camera around so you can see what I'm doing. 
So, this is a little rectangle of atoms, each gold atom pushed in place. Um, before and after hopefully will appear on the screen. Each blob there, each circle is a single gold atom and what I'm hoping is that we can find some electrons within there, within that little container. It probably needs to be compacted a little bit more and the atoms move together a little bit more, but it's getting there, it's, it's getting there. You could ask, and a very, very valid question to ask is, couldn't you automate this? Yes, it could, it could be automating. A number of groups um, have automated the manipulation of atoms using scanning probes. And yes, it's definitely something that's on the agenda for us, and indeed we've, we've uh, made moves in that direction before. Um, there is something to be said, though, with a brand new instrument like this one to sort of get your hands dirty doing the manipulation um, sort of by hand as it were and um, getting a feel for how the instrument behaves, how the feedback, feedback loop behaves etc. Um, though I must admit it getting to half three in the morning um, perhaps it really should be a question of handing it over to the computer because the computer doesn't get tired quite like we do. So spend some time trying to build structures atom by atom to contain electrons and then realize well nature can do the job even better and um, I don't have to spend a lot of time putting things together moving atoms across the surface. So in this particular gold surface we found these beautiful triangular structure that is oh, you can see the scale bar at the bottom 10 nanometers, so it's about 10 nanometers edge and it's pretty much a perfect equilateral triangle. That's fun enough, but over here, what we can see, and it's over right in the previous image, but what you can see is the electron waves that are trapped within that structure. It's absolutely stunning. It's so much fun just changing the energy and watching how these waves, these wave patterns change. I am blown away by the stability and just capability of this instrument. It is fantastic. Out of the can and you can glue a tip onto it. Or blue, um, or blue tack. Oh, you can, yeah, you, perhaps not. In, in the real case, we don't blue tack it on. Um, we actually do glue it on, but actually the, the gluing is probably just about that accurate. <laughs>